Warren, what took you from writing books like Father and Child Reunion and your forthcoming Boy Crisis to inventing a new system of couples communication? When I was doing the research on the Boy Crisis, I started that about 15 years ago. I, one of the first things I noticed was that um, in developed nations, um, boys were falling behind girls and, I, um, and, and much farther behind them than they used to be for themselves. And so I looked at what was happening in developed nations and developed nations almost always gave greater permission for divorce. And divorce led to less father involvement. And when there was less father involvement, both boys and girls did much worse, but boys did even significantly, uh, even, even considerably more um, poorly than, than girls did. And so that got me to thinking, I didn't want to stop divorces if that was necessary for a couple to feel good about themselves and each other. Um, so how did I, how can I make marriages better so that there wouldn't be the divorces to begin with? And so that got me thinking about that issue. I see. So you currently teach a lot of workshops for about half of the couples coming are trying to improve their marriage and relationships and about half, um, this is their last effort to keep the marriage together, having been to couples therapy and it didn't, and it didn't work. So what do you do that's different from couples therapy? Uh, a lot of the couples were telling me that when they went to an individual therapist, that during the week they were honing their argument to sort of persuade the therapist to, uh, to um, take their side, if you will. And that obviously was the opposite of what <laughs> couples therapy should be about, but it was happening. And the second way, they, the best method by far was active listening, but active listening studies that were done on it found that that people were not using it without a therapist, which meant therefore that it was only available to relatively wealthy people. And so that was pretty sad too. And so I started looking at why was it so re people resistant to it uh, when uh, there was no therapist there. And I saw that the person, uh, for the person giving criticism, um, it active listening was great, they were heard. Um, but for the person receiving criticism, their biologically natural propensity to have defenses was wiped out. And they not only had to not have defenses, they had to repeat the criticism to the person and keep going at it until they got it accurately. And very few people looked forward to that. Um, so I started asking myself, is there a way of having a person experience criticism in such a way that we can get around the biological natural propensity of criticism to be experienced in a, def in a way that creates um, us as being defensive. And so in experimenting with that, I came up with two, dividing the week for my couples into two parts. 166 hours of the week is a conflict-free zone. Two hours is a caring and sharing time. During the caring and sharing time of two hours is when they focus on their concerns. I'll explain more about that in a moment. But the 166 hours of conflict-free zone, my first job was to help the couples know how to sustain conflict-free freedom during that period of time, get, be secure. And so what I got couples to do was to learn how to appreciate each other and secondly, how to put the conflicts on hold because there was a because if they didn't put the conflicts on hold, the couple would their partner would naturally respond defensively. But during the caring and sharing time, they had learned how to know and predict that their partner would respond by associating their criticism with love. And so now I had to train the couples to associate the criticism with love. So that would be a realistic promise so that they could um, that, that they could invest in the conflict free zone. So the job of, of getting the couples to to um, experience being criticized as being loved was not natural. So I had to create an unnatural altering of the mindsets. And so I did a series of experiences in the workshops that then led to seven different mindsets, which before any person receives criticism, they alter their normal state of defensiveness into associating that potential criticism with an opportunity to be loved more deeply. Um, so for example, um, I give them a, um, I, I ask everyone in the workshop, would you die 
for, for your partner have a 50% take a 50% chance of dying for your partner if you had a 100% chance of saving your partner's life give them a couple of examples 95% of the men say yes they would die for their uh, their woman friend or partner or, or gay male friend and about 80% uh, 80 to 85% of the women say they would die for their partner and then I move it to, if you wouldn't die for your partner, would you lose an arm or a leg for your partner? So then the first mindset becomes, um, each person says before they hear the criticism of their partner, if um, this is, if I would die for Mary or Joe, at least I can listen so Mary or Joe will blossom. And that makes sense once they've convinced themselves that they would die for this person, listening is fairly easy. So that's one example. That's pretty neat. That's um, so in, in this caring and sharing time, what are some of the key skills that you teach couples? I teach them uh, first um, other, other meditations like a love guarantee. Um, and then um, I also uh, so, for example, the love guarantee would go something like this. Um, the, before they hear the criticisms, they say, if I can create a secure environment for my partner's feelings no matter what they are i know my partner will feel more loved by me so therefore i know it makes sense that they will love me more when they feel more loved by me and so now they're associating what's coming in criticism mode as an opportunity be, to be loved more deeply and so um, there's five of the mindsets, but I, we, we don't have the time to get into those now, but that gives you a little bit of an idea of the, of the altered state that changes the natural biological response of defensiveness. Oh. So, so um, in, the, in the process of doing this, are you uh, using methods to help calm people's amygdalas so they don't get into fight or flight mode? Uh, things like deep breathing and being mindfully present uh, do you do techniques like that to get them to a space where they can listen to criticism? Yes, that's you know the meditation of the seven altered mindsets is coupled with deep breathing and relaxing. But it's amazing how um, once somebody is seeing that their partner is going to be loving them more, the more they express their story, and they know how to um, let their story be freely presented. Uh, that there's no need, there, there's less need for stress and therefore less need for deep breathing. Wow. Now, now what, what kind of follow-up assessments do you do and what have they revealed about the impact of this training on couples going forward? I invite every couple to join me for free group follow-up phone calls. So uh, the group appears on the phone, each one says what each couple says what worked for them. Each couple says where they had some challenges. Uh, what worked for people inspires other people. What the challenges are, I deal with their challenges. And actually, the challenges that they present inspire other people because they say, all right, I don't feel so badly about the way I did. And so everybody, um, and so those follow-up phone calls are crucial. Um, and, the, and then um, after each group has their individual follow-up phone calls, I have um, follow-up phone calls that everyone that's been in a workshop of mine is invited to, to join as well. Those are really educational for me and for everyone else. I'd say about, so at the beginning, 60% of people um, uh, use the method and use, uh, and about most of those, but not all of those, join the follow-up phone calls. And then there's a percentage of those, so I'd say totally about 30% use the the um, method consistently the ones that use it consistently which means that particularly they um, they do a very careful reading of the seven mindsets before they listen to their partner's criticism and then secondly they have learned well how to put conflicts on hold so the couples that do that i'd say which is about 30 percent of all the couples that go through the workshop uh, they report, I, I don't think I've seen a, anything less than 100% um, of couples just saying it, it somewhere between it works miracles and this, and just be ecstatic and falling back in love again. And I have to say that I am most motivated by the seeing couples that are uh, on the verge of divorce um, and um, be sort of just love each other again. 
um, it's been uh, that's been one of the inspirations of my doing this. So it goes without saying that for those couples, the relationship doesn't end in divorce or breakup. Correct. And there's a, occasionally when a couple has done it cons fairly consistently, um, they have decided that they're the, not the right partners for each other. Um, but they, um, as they sort of knew all along, uh, but particularly if they have children, they are communicating in a loving way and the children are seeing they, they aren't going through the same traumas that children normally go through. Uh, when their partners break up because it's a it, everybody is working together and so um, it's not a requirement that the couple i don't consider it a failure if the couple decides to to part um, but parts in a way uh, that is loving and caring but 90 percent of the time i'd say it ends up with the partners staying together and just being more in love oh excellent um it, this is for, for couples in your area. This is expensive for them to come to this workshop. Can you imagine a way this training can be made available to lower income couples? Yes, yes, and yes. This is the crucial um, thing that I care about. Um, I, I really would love to see um, a, 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 it be part of our federal programs and um, dealing with child support and so on. That child support happens best um, when there is... Um, when there is support for the parents to be good communicators and that and this needs to start in my opinion in the public schools uh, especially in the urban areas it needs to start with the children and the parents simultaneously it is in my opinion um, a problem when the children become able to communicate and then they go home and they see their parents communicating in a much more destructive way it, then that makes the children lose respect for the parents and that creates a different set of problems. So my um, advocacy is that the children learn it in public schools and that the parents learn it with the children at the same time and so that the family uh, dynamic can change and those children can become leaders um, of, of other children who are starting to respect um, the way they are able to handle interpersonal communication. Oh, great. If For people that are interested in a train the trainers model, uh, how would, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, if um, I'm in the process now, I'm getting older, so that I want to train trainers and not have me be doing this. And so um, just contact me at warrenferrell.com. That's, you know, F-A-R-R-E-L-L.com. Um, and I will be, uh, my email is on the uh, homepage of my website. Um, and so just, um, I will be happy to respond to you and um, tell okay, you how to get involved. Well, thank you very much, Warren.